Good afternoon and welcome to everyone who has uh, logged in to hear the uh, STEM lecture for today. <clears throat> today is the 16th in a series of Zoom lectures sponsored by Congregation KINS. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with the uh, program, the speaker will choose a topic related to either science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, psychology, and we'll correlate it with Torah. Uh, this, although we've had 16 lectures so far, well, including this one, this will be the first time that I can say that I have known the speaker for his entire life. The speaker today is Rabbi Phil Karish. This topic is related to both science and psychology. And the topic is ancient wisdom and modern research Modern research uncovers ancient truths. I think many of you may know Phil, but for a very brief bio, he is of course a Chicago native, attended Fassman High School at uh, Hebrew Theological College, attended Yeshiva University from which he graduated and received smicha, earned a master's degree in Jewish education from Loyola University. He has worked for Yeshiva University Kolot Tor Mitzion for NCSY and currently for the Orthodox Union. In his so-called spare time, he is a moil and a magi cheer for Dafyomi. And Phil and Rachel and their six children live right here in Rogers Park. Uh, in one moment, I'm going to turn the program over to Phil, but I want to remind you that you will always have two opportunities to ask questions. You may unmute yourself at any time during the presentation and also after completion of the um, presentation, I will give you another opportunity. Now I'll turn the program over to Phil. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karish. Uh, appreciate your introduction. Thank you very much. Um, in your uh, in your young seventies, you've uh, started and already accomplished four masechtas and tafiomi, and uh, being a marvitz Torah in this frame. So uh, a role model on many fronts. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, when we're raising little children, uh, parents know best. Children think they know best, but really parents know best. Just a couple of days ago on Hanukkah, my, uh, my two-year-old son thought that it was a wise idea to take a candle and to light it from one of the other candles on our table. Now, we as parents were uh, within, uh, within spitting distance, and we quickly caught on to his little scenario. He has no idea that fire is dangerous. He doesn't know. He, he doesn't understand the idea. We as parents see with clarity, but the child is completely blind to the dangers. So we have a rule in place. Children don't play with matches. We took it away from him and he cried. Why are you taking away my fun? Not exactly the words he said, but his tears implied as much. A second scene may be a little bit different. It's bedtime and we tell our children that they have to brush their teeth. If they brush their teeth, then they'll have fewer cavities, fewer uh, problems with their oral hygiene down the road. It's just a good thing to do. Child does not know, know best, the parents know best. Our children, they may well sit in our laps, they have no clue why we have the rules that we have at the age of, uh, of being a toddler, they have no clue. But one thing that the children know that is that the parents are in charge. Now, the reason why uh, we're able to make these rules for our children, that which is forbidden for them, playing with matches, that which is in the positive, what we want them to do, such as brushing their teeth, we see the bigger picture and they don't. As it relates to Torah Judaism, Kodesh Baruch Hu, God does not need a letter of approbation that we think that his Torah is awesome. We are the children sitting in his lap. And when the Torah lists that which we are not supposed to do, that which we refer to as mitzvos losa ase, that which is forbidden, you can't kill, you can't steal, and a plethora of other laws for which we are restricted. Fine. We don't understand it all. Sometimes they may not seem totally logical. You can't wear shotmas, you can't wear woolen linen. I don't know that there's a, a research article out there that would indicate any challenges of wearing wool and linen together. Nevertheless, parent knows best, child doesn't know best, and we do our best to, to keep the mitzvot. That's our job. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't need our letter of approbation. The Torah is perfect in every way, shape, and form. It lacks nothing. Um, in the process of going through Daf Yomi, we see all the exegetical parts. How do you get from, from the verses in the Torah to the way that we behave? Very complicated and uh, we need to understand what Hashem wants from us. But we are the child who sits in the lab. He knows what's best. And in fact, the only actions that we as human beings can do that are permanent, that are eternal, are actions that blend 
the physical and the spiritual. I can do a Misa. We are sitting and learning Torah and we are earning eternity for this because we're doing something that is part of Hashem's Torah. And in fact, the Maharal Prague writes this explicitly, that the language of the word mitzvah is from the word sab, which means to have connectedness. Every time we avoid a losa, say a negative commandment, and every time we execute an say a positive commandment, we have tethered ourselves still, ourselves still more and still closer to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. In fact, this is one of the main, um, a main sticking points in the world of Chabad to get someone to just do any one mitzvah, even if it's not in the in the landscape of total shmiras. Every mitzvah connects us still more to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. and that the Maharal writes is, is from the language of the word mitzvah. So, well, what are we going to do today? Uh, today is not to uh, inspire us to keep mitzvos because we understand them, because as mentioned, we should be keeping the mitzvos either way, because a Kodesh Baruch Hu has uh, sat us on his lap and said, I'm telling you what's good for you. The goal of today is to understand the beauty and to understand the grandeur and the depth of the Torah mitzvos. We'll understand them a little bit and hopefully as a conclusion, we'll be able to say, that we have been given a remarkable portion. It's not just that the Torah is beautiful. Even if it wasn't, it would be Kedai, but it's also beautiful. And one of the things that we are seeing is that there's a fair amount of modern day research with aligns with major areas of Torah thought, ideas that go back either to Psukim themselves or to early commentaries in the Rishonim or Achronim. As a major brushstroke of this idea, it's interesting to note that if you were to look at the Dalet Chelke Shulchan Aruch, the four actual books of codified Jewish law, not all of the books of Jewish law, just the, what made the cut, what made it into the Shulchan Aruch. It's a fascinating idea. About 25% of all of Jewish law is about food. It's pretty remarkable. What's kosher and what's not kosher? The laws of Shechita, the laws of Trefa, the laws of Malicha, the laws of Taaroves. You're obligated to eat on Shabbos of four meals within a 25, 26 hour uh, frame. What is considered to be achila? What is considered to be bread? Five grains, barley, rayot, wheat, spelt, thousands of halachos. You have to eat on sukkahs, in the sukkah, not in the sukkah. What can you eat in the sukkah? What can you not? Approximately by volume, 25% of all of halacha is about food. The next quarter of all of Jewish law, in approximate numbers, is its own dedicated volume called Choshen Mishpat. Choshen Mishpat is the section of the Shulchan Aruch, it's the chilek, the volume of the Shulchan Aruch that deals with the extensive and nuanced laws of interpersonal financial uh, relationships with other people. That's what our Bate didn't spend a lot of time dealing with when people have disagreements about how the finance went. I lent person uh, a person this amount of money on the condition of X. Oh, I don't agree to condition X. I didn't sign on that. It wasn't written in the contract. Where obviously, of course, we're not allowed to steal. The halacha is you're not allowed to steal anything, even if it's less than a shava pruta, even if it's less than than uh, of what is a what would be a significant halachic value as it relates to punishment. But if I steal one paper clip from you, that's called ganeva. You're not allowed to. There's no uh, there's no onesh for it because it's too small. You did, didn't hit the threshold, but you can't steal. You can't take other people's uh, take other people's products without rishus. It's not allowed. It's just totally not allowed. Also related to finances, we're obligated to give Meiser. How do we define Meiser? Does, does tuition count for Meiser? If I'm getting paying membership to the show, well, how much of that is pure is pure tzedakah? I mean, they, I do pay for the electricity bills when I pay part of my membership. So this is the second bucket. Again, the first 25% by and large, again, general is about food. The second is about uh, finances. The third quarter of all of Jewish code by volume in approximation, is about relationships, intimacy, and the laws of marriage. Again, the, the chilek of Evan Ha'ezer, uh, and this is also found in Yoridea, the halachos of Nida explicitly are found in Yoridea. There's really quite a bit of, of evidence in this regard uh, that speaks to relationships, the laws of how to get married. When I was in elementary school, there was a boy who walked over to a girl and he handed her a pencil and said, and he handed her the pencil and she took it. Huge Shaila in the post game is that considered a marriage? There were plenty of people around that were Aiden. So we got to get into the halachos. Turned out they weren't married, just if you're wondering what the end of the story was, because it was her pencil. But had it been his pencil, Utaka would have been a very big problem. Maybe she would have had to get divorced and marry Kohanim. Not simple. Not simple. So um, there are just so many laws in so many of these areas. And if, if an academic were to look at the Torah from an a-religious perspective, they would look at the Torah and they'd see this book that almost smells of psychology. We have to control our desires, food, money, and intimacy. 
Rav Moshe Shapira Zatzal, who passed away just a few years ago, one of his Talmidim, Rabbi Akiva Tatz, says a beautiful idea. The reason why we as human beings are so troubled with the realms of uh, food and intimacy, why these two realms are so powerful as it relates to our Yetzir Hara, our temptations, is because the world only needs those two things to continue, food and intimacy. Nothing else is required. And because fundamentally, on a soul, on a neshama level, we are interested in the continuity of the world, we therefore struggle with these areas more than we do with others. So these three brushstrokes are, uh, are, are, are important to kind of paint a general picture that the value of the Torah is in and of itself valuable. And if we were to try to overlay that with a meaning that we could understand, there's a tremendous amount of psychological benefit to it, to following the Torah. It teaches us a fundamental discipline of how to um, make sure that we're in control of our food eating habits. We still struggle, we still struggle. So if I like, uh, if I like a food that's milchik, but I'm fleshik, I lose my Yitzhahara for the food because I'm, I'm acclimated. I grew up in a home, we kept kosher from day one. So I'm not, by me, it's not a frum thing. It's just, that's the way that we grew up. But there's a natural discipline. It's fundamental to the infrastructure of halacha. There's a natural discipline when it comes to, uh, to the world of Judaism from a halachic perspective. So uh, that is the introductory remarks. And what we're gonna do now is speak about three examples in a little bit more color, in a little bit more detail to gain a tremendous appreciation, hopefully, for that which uh, would be our world of Torah. In the 1970s, there was a psychologist whose name is Aaron Beck. Aaron Beck is the person for whom they attribute the type of therapy that's referred to as cognitive behavioral therapy. At its essence, cognitive behavioral therapy speaks to the fact that your cognition can affect your emotions, your emotions can affect your cognition, and the two of those things can affect the way that you behave. So here is, for example, um, a, uh, a chart. Let me just pull that up. I'm going to share, uh, do a little screen share with you so you can see the way that, um, that he, he painted this picture of cognitive behavioral therapy because they have an interplay. Cognitive behavioral therapy, there's an interplay between your thought, between your emotions, and between your behavior. What we think affects how we act and feel. What we feel affects what we think and do. And of course, your behavior, what we do, there is a cyclical nature to this. So um, this is actually quite prevalent. My wife, Rachie, is a, is a therapist at Madragos Midwest. Um, she's the executive director there, and she is uh, involved on the client level as well as in running the organization. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a staple. It's a regular form of therapy. What they basically do is they find out what cognition or what emotion is lending to the troublesome behavior, and then the therapist will help to rewire that particular person's cognition or emotions. Just say, for example, that we have a formula of sorts in our brain. When I'm angry, I overeat and I get depressed. Let's say that that were, were to be the case in a non-clinical form. I just, that's my nature. When I'm stressed out, I overeat. So, so cognitive behavioral therapy would say, let's focus on what your wiring is for when you're stressed out. Can we change if X, then A? Can we change the A, which is overeating, to if X, if I'm stressed, then B, then I do breathing techniques, or then I do meditation, or I go for a jog, or I have a healthier coping mechanism. This is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. But let's recognize that Aaron T. Beck was living in the 1970s, and he established it only then. Yet in our tradition, this has been around for a very long time. Let's learn a little bit of uh, what the Torah has to say about, um, let's learn a little bit what the Torah has to say about Los Achmod. Of course, we are all familiar uh, that Los Achmod is one of the Ten Commandments that we are not allowed to covet. So what does it mean that we're not allowed to covet? What if, what if I see something that's desirable? You're going to tell me to just not have any feelings. At the end of the day, Los Achmod Beis Reecha, you can't be, you can't covet that which uh, is your friend's home, Los Achmod Eishas Reecha, one cannot uh, desire someone else's wife, Va'avdo, and their servants, Va'amaso, and their maidservants, Vishoro, Vachamoro, their animals, Vichol Asher Reecha. You're not allowed to have any desires for things that are not yours. So the Ibn Ezra, who lived in Spain, and he, he had a very hard time with this, as should we all, intuitively. There is a mitzvah in the Torah that tells me not to have a feeling. What does that mean? You're, you can control how I feel, but I feel it already. If I see that my neighbor has a car that I want, my neighbor has a house that I want, if I want it, then I want it. How do you prevent me 
from thinking that I want it, from feeling that I want it. The Torah has set a bar to even control our instinctive feelings. Now, Lo Sachmod has a parameter in Jewish law about when you violate it. It's when you force the person to sell that car to you. There are parameters to it. But fundamentally, the Ibn Ezra was bothered. So please feel free to read along here. We're going to read the Ibn Ezra's English commentary. I'll just say as a caveat before we read this that, yes, the movie Aladdin does throw a wrench into the system here, but recognize that it's only a movie. And you'll see what that means shortly. You shall not covet, writes the Ibn Ezra. Many people have wondered about this commandment. How is it that a man not covet in his heart that which is beautiful and all that which appears pleasant in his eyes? I'll give you a parable to, this, uh, to, to explain this. You should know, writes the Ibn Ezra, that a villager who thinks correctly and sees that the king's daughter is beautiful will not covet her in his heart, that he should not sleep with her, as he knows that this is impossible. And this villager will not think like one of the lunatics that desires that he should have wings to fly in the sky when it is not possible. This is like that which a man does not desire to sleep even with his mother, even though she is beautiful, as they have been accustomed to this from youth, to know that it's forbidden to him. So must every enlightened person know that a beautiful woman or money that is not attained by a person because of his wisdom or knowledge, rather it is from that which God apportioned to him. This is what the Ibn Ezra writes. In other words, what does the Pasuk of Lo Sachmod mean? What does the Pasuk mean when it says that you shall not covet? It's cognitive behavioral therapy. In your cognition, you think that the princess is shy to you. You think that that's a reality. It's not a reality. Yes, in the movies, it's a reality. But in real life, the pauper who's covered in dirt and wearing rags that are tattered at the edges he won't even catch the attention of the princess. It's not even in the cards. It's not something that will happen. And because of that, when you work on your cognition, instead of your cognition saying, if X, if I see a princess, then B, I'll desire her, says the Ibn Ezra, you need to work on your cognition. She's not attainable to you under the circumstances. And therefore, if X, not B, I have to change my wiring, change my cognition, change my feelings to say, if X, if I see a beautiful princess, I'm fine. I'm okay. I don't desire her. I can sense that she's beautiful, but it not, in a, not in a way that would play out in a practical way. I don't desire her. I don't desire the car. I don't desire my neighbor's house. This, in effect, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, please understand, by no means does this trump therapy if someone needs therapy in a clinical form. I am in no, no way even hinting to that. Of course, if there's a clinical need for therapy, one should do so. And they may well use CBT. The therapist may well use CBT and other forms of therapy to help a, a person reach their, their healthy place in life. Absolutely. But this is just trying to highlight an idea that the Torah has been talking about this for a thousand years since the Ibn Ezra, 900 years since the Ibn Ezra, it's a Pasuk in the Torah. Lo Sachmod, the Ibn Ezra is explaining that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us on Har Sinai, Lo Sachmod, that you're not allowed to covet that which belongs to others, that's because we are in control of that. If we have the capacity, if we have the, the patience and the perseverance to rewire the way we are cognitively approaching a scenario, we then can in turn affect the result of the formula. We can change the wiring of our brain to say, if stressed, then eat, to if stressed, then exercise. We can control that. We have the capacity to impact the way that we think, to impact the way that we therefore behave. This is one beautiful idea that's uh, quoted in the Ibn Ezra. This is a much spoken about uh, opinion approach of the Ibn Ezra in regards to controlling our feelings. And that is sample number one. Sample number two. Rav Dessler um, is very well known for this idea. Rav Dessler writes that when it comes to relationships, that the way that one would define a relationship is when there is ahava, when there is love. Now, we know that, and a husband and wife in a colloquial sense may say, I love you, and they may say that, that they love you back, and may, they may reciprocate with such a phrase. But in Torah tradition, the need to see beyond yourself and to give to others is fundamental. And that's why Rav Dessler writes that if you want to love something or someone, you need to invest and give to them. Let's say, for example, a person is in construction and they built a home. They're walking down the street and they see the home that they built. All the ornate features, all of the details that are there, 
Look at the moldings around the window. Look at the limestone. Look at how the bricks are patterned and the landscaping. Oh, amazing. They've got bricks behind the grass leading up to the bushes. Gorgeous. Why does he care so much about that house? Why does he care more than I do? Because he invested in it. He's given his, his sweat and his tears and his brains and his efforts to that home. So he sees every detail. I may never see it. I may never recognize it because that's his world. That's his Daladamos. That's what he's given to in relationships. If relationships hope to be healthy, then it must be that each person is giving. Whereas in a uh, simplistic way, a relationship may be envisioned as I'll do 50% and my wife will do 50% and therefore we total 100%. Well, that could lead to frustration. Let's say that on a day that I can't do 50% today and my schedule doesn't allow it, I can only do 30%. Well, then by definition, the 20% that I'm lacking gets put on somebody else's plate. That could lead to frustration. But imagine if the scenario were flipped. I want to do 100%. I want to give endlessly. I want to give and give and give because that's what makes me love. And my wife feels the same way. Then everyone wants to do 100%. There's no longer frustration. The giving generates a closeness. It's a very, very, very powerful idea. In fact, this selflessness has woven itself uh, into the fabric of Jewish tradition going all the way back. The Pasuk writes in Sefer Mishlei that Bechesed ve'emes yechuparavon. The Pasuk writes that if a person does chesed, they, are, uh, they do kindness. And if they are also MS, if they're honest people. So the Pasuk says, Yechuparavon, that the slate is cleaned. All their sins get dissolved. So the Maharal Prague again, the Maharal says, what's going on in this Pasuk over here? I don't understand. If you're a Baal chesed, if you do kind things, and all of a sudden all your sins get uh, taken away. So says the Maharal, yeah, that's exactly right. What is the reason why a person would choose to do a sin? Here's basically the subtext of a person doing a sin. God says, I don't want you to, uh, to break Shabbos. And you say, thanks, but no thanks. I'll do my thing. In other words, you put yourself before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You, you were in the center. Uh, you were in the epicenter of all the concentric rings. You're the hush of one. You're the important one. Hashem says, keep Shabbos. And you say, no, thank you. That's when you're in the center. But when a Kaddish Baruch Hu is in the center and you're in the concentric rings around him and he says, keep Shabbos, then it's our, if, if your mind is right, then you're second and you're not first. So says the Maharal Prague, when a person does chesed, what, what is chesed? It's where you stop thinking about yourself. You think outside of yourself, beyond your nose to the needs and the, and the wants of others. And you do something for them, even at the, at the sacrifice of something that you may want. That level of giving is called selflessness, it's chesed. When you reflect selflessness, you're also showing a Kaddish Baruch Hu that even the sins that I did were only because I was selfish, I was off my game. But really I need to be selfless. I need to give, I need to recognize that I am second and not that I am first. And that is a, a fundamental idea. Now there's an author, uh, his name is Adam Grant. Adam Grant has written a whole number of books. Here's a famous one of them called Give and Take. It's not a short book, pretty thick. Here's another one of these book called, books called The Go-Giver by Bob Berg and John David Mann. And these books are being put out by Wall Street. They're being put out by businesses for the sake of businesses. It's not being put out for some feel good. It's called on the top of the book, A Revolutionary Approach to Success. This is run by the bottom dollar. This is not run by by the feel good section at Barnes and Nobles. This is meant to move businesses. What at the end of the day ends up moving people? Other people. I, we say this in, in the OU world all the time. I'm writing a, a prospectus right now and I wrote in this prospectus, programs don't move people, people move people. And when you build great relationships with people, healthy, normal relationships where it's not all about you, there's a give, I want, I care about you. I, my, my, one of my previous employers used to say to me all the time, I hope you leave my department. I hope I can graduate you from where I am. Give and give and give, elevate, move people along. When your relationships are wired, that way everything's better. It's like we would say more casually, the nice guy always wins out. When you're good to other people, your relationships are better and things in general are much better. There's a tremendous amount of research in the modern era right now that speaks about the power of giving and its importance and its capacity to change not only others, but probably most critically as it relates to the growth, uh, to our growth as individuals and as a people, to make sure that we are selfless and not selfish, that we are able to see beyond our own nose to give to others. And that is why uh, the research nowadays is pushing to be more giving.
They're pushing it from a different angle. It's not with altruism necessarily, though there may be elements of it. They're doing it because of the bottom line. But as Jews, we have to be wired that way. When a person is, is sensitive, when a person can put their needs second to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then Hashem's like, I got, if you're willing to put yourself second to me, I'm going to destroy all your Averas. Because the only reason you sinned in the first place was because of your misunderstanding of your selfishness. You're, you're a narcissist. You thought you were Hashem. You're not the most important person in the world. You're all second to me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the middle. And we are surrounding him. And that is area number two, an area of giving. Matanos le'avyonim, we're obligated to give gifts. We have to give bikurim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We have to give korbanos to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And similarly, on that note, what is the shorish of the, of the word korbanos? So the svarim write, it's, kor, it's karev. It's not korban, it's karev. Bring me close. Why does a korban, why is that the consequence? When, if I do an iser do so God forbid, I do, I do a, a biblical violation. And um, it was by accident. So the halacha is I have to bring a korban chatas. I'm obligated to bring a korban, to bring a sacrifice. What does that have to do with anything? What a Kodesh Baruch Hu needs me to kill an animal for him. He's fine. He's fine. He doesn't need me. So this is far and right, total misunderstanding. The reason why we have to bring korbanos that I own, I take the animal that I paid for with hard-earned money, and I schlep it to the base, I make dash, and I make sure that it's karev, that it, that it gets sacrificed. Because when you're makriv for others, when you sacrifice that which belongs to you, which you earned, which you had to work for, and you give it to others, it induces a connectedness. The Kodesh Baruch Hu is saying, you did, I can't have you be far from me. I can't have you be distant from me. I need you to bring a korban. I need you to be karov, to be close to me. Please, please bring a korban chatas. Beautiful idea. Beautiful idea. And that's area number two. The last area that I'd like to share, and one that is found in the research as well of, of late, in the last uh, decade or so, is in the area of marriage and family therapy. How so? So, uh, of course, we all are all familiar uh, with the general world of, of the laws of Nida, that for uh, the average couple, uh, you know, in the, in the early years of marriage, for the average couple out of any particular month, so there's a, a stretch of time when a couple is not allowed to be intimate, uh, a whole slew of rules that are surrounding that Hilchus Nida is a very complicated area. When I was in Smicha, my Hilchus Nida notes were 290 pages. It was a tremendous amount of information. It's, it's just a huge breadth of information that's very nuanced. Uh, changes with modern medicines, and uh, it's a very unique area of research to start with. But we have a built-in system. Rav Meir writes this in the Gemara. Rav Meir writes that uh, basically the principles of Hilchos Nida Shrecha that you have these uh, areas of halacha that teach us to to maintain balance, to maintain a semblance of uh, of excitement within a relationship. So these areas are, are hyper detailed. So I'll just give a, by way of example. The Shulchan Aruch speaks of an idea uh, what are referred to as harchakos. These are nuances within the realms of Hilchos Nida. So the dogma, for example, um, the, the harchaka that's stipulated in the world of Hilchos Nida, if, that if, a, if a woman is in her Nida state, so then if a husband wants to pass something to her, so he should put it down, it's called Hoshatam Yad Layad. So instead of passing it directly, that this is quoted in the, in the post game, you should put it down first and then she should pick it up. So what that does is it prevents the incidental, accidental hands touching. What's the big deal? It's not such an intimate experience to touch a finger. It's not, it's not so, so to write the, write the Sifrei Ashkafa, this idea is actually very powerful. This is what helps to maintain that even the simple act of holding a hand could be meaningful many years into a relationship. It requires work on the relationship in general, but this system is one that Rav Meir highlights in the Gemara as a very powerful one. The modern day research, what you'll find if you were to speak to marriage and family therapists and those who are guiding couples, they've come up with this innovative idea. What's the innovative idea that they've come up with in, uh, in, the, in the 21st century? Uh, abstinence. Every little while you should take a break. Every little while there should be a time when intimacy is just not one of the options. And that way it will hopefully recenter the couple. Welcome. Welcome to the world. This is a Pasuk in Vayikra. These are psukim in the Torah. We've been living this culture for thousands of years. Now, to say in a vacuum that this is the reason why the divorce rates in the Orthodox community at large are lower, that would be difficult to say. 
in the early 2000s, there was a study of divorce rates in the Orthodox community. In this study, the way that they defined Orthodox was those who had memberships with Orthodox institutions. So the number is skewed on both sides. Uh, there may be people who are uh, Orthodox who don't have shul membership, and they're plenty Orthodox. And there may be people who are not Orthodox who are part of the study either way because they have a, an Orthodox membership, they're affiliated with an Orthodox synagogue, but they themselves may not be. Either way, in this study that was done, I believe it was in 2007, in this study that was done, they found that the divorce rate in the Orthodox community at that time, it's increased a little bit most likely, uh, at that time was hovering around 10%, while the study then quoted that the United States average was approximately 41%, four in 10 marriages were, were, uh, were worthy of divorce. But to be clear, the, the, the post came right. This is in the, all of the Svarim, the Sefer Achinuch quotes, and it's based on a Pasuk in Sefer Dvarim, the Chasab La Sefer Krisus, that for when it's appropriate, divorce is an avenue. We have Bate Din that, that write Gitten all the time. And uh, when there's a time and a place for it, then it's appropriate. Great, if one has not uh, been able to work out the marriage with all of the appropriate investments understood. So it, I, I could not say uh, in good conscience that, that the only reason that uh, the Jewish marriages by and large last longer is because of that. And is there a percentage of people who don't want to separate their marriages because, yeah, that's possible. But this certainly donates uh, to the efficacy and quality of a marriage as couples navigate their marriages year after year and decade after decade. And this idea is, uh, is supported in, in, in some of the modern research. There are some uh, studies and graphs to, to look at if you're interested in looking at them. But these are just a couple of ideas in some of these areas. Food restrictions, uh, again, food restrictions and money and intimacy, intimacy, these three areas are very, very powerful areas of psychology. And it, what it does is it helps us to stay balanced, hopefully, if we are looking at the Torah through the right lens, it will hopefully help us to stay balanced. We're, we're able to have a Torah, and even if we are the kids sitting in the lab, we don't, uh, we don't understand everything. What we understand, we barely understand. We're barely scratching the surface. Even the deepest of Svarim that speak about a particular mitzvah, it's so hard to get to the, to the real root, a, a rabbit hole. It's, it's just so hard to grasp the depths of, a, of any mitzvah. We're relative to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, feeble-minded is a compliment. We're nowhere close to a Kaddish Baruch Hu on that realm. The mitzvahs are so remarkably deep. But we're the child sitting on the lap I take my kids for injections all the time. I'm the one who holds them, sit in my lap, and I grab their arms and hold them tight. And the doctor comes in and puts a little needle in the arm for, for a vaccination, for an injection, whatever the case may be. What were the kids sitting there kicking and screaming? So what, what is it that makes a child comfortable? What really makes a child comfortable, because after they take that shot, they turn around and cuddle up on you. Why do they do that? Because they know that in the scheme of things, with all the things that they don't understand, but your love for them is greater. We are no different. We are the child sitting in the lap. We are the child looking up at a Kaddish Baruch Hu Kaviyachal and saying, I don't understand the difficult things. I don't understand the mitzvot that I don't understand. Instead of just calling it a burden, we as Jews, our hashkafa is a little different. And we say this in Uvalet Zion every day. Baruch Hashem, Yom Yom Ya'amos Lanu. Thank you. Thank you for the burdens, quote unquote, that we have. We don't understand everything that happens, but we recognize that with all of the goodness that you've given us with, uh, with life, with overarchingly good health, uh, with all of the blessings that we ha we've had, even with all of the mixtures of all of the challenges that we've had, at the end of the day, it is a bracha to be able to live and to do mitzvos so that when, please God, at 120, we'll be able to say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I did my piece, Ashrenu matov chalkeinu, that we have a Torah that is so beautiful, it, tethers us from this temporary world to the permanent world and gives us an eternal existence beyond our physical bodies on the level of the neshama. And these are just but a few examples. There are dozens more. I don't want to take up too much of, of your time. These are just a few examples. And uh, hopefully as we continue to grow individually in our own Judaism, as we begin to refine ourselves still more, the cup spilleth over and we can begin to influence others as well. Just as a closing note, um, and this note is uh, not directly related to what we're discussing, but it is a ripple effect of what we're discussing, is that when we become very um, excited, when we become very uh, enthused by what the Torah has given to us, people see it. And there's a certain contagiousness to that that enables us to influence others. And this is the concept of being the Kadeh Shem Shemayim Berabim, of being Mar Bekvot Shemayim to ensure that we are doing our grand message of the Jewish people, of making sure that the messages of the Torah are far and wide, both within the community and being an influence to the communities that surround us. 
Uh, that is the Torah that I wanted to share with you today. I'm happy to stay on. If people have questions, of course, feel free to sign off if you don't have any. And thank you for joining. Uh, happy to try and answer any questions if you have. Thank you. It was beautiful. Uh -huh. Very nice. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Um, I would also like to offer my special thanks to Phil for his both excellent and very insightful presentation today. Anyone has a question? Now is the time. If not, then I would like to remind you that the next STEM lecture will be one week from today, December 29th at noon. The speaker will be Rabbi Shimon Fetter, a local Chicago boy who is now making good in Boca Raton. And his topic will be Attitude of Gratitude, the Power of Hakara Satov. And uh, we're all looking forward to hearing that presentation. At any time, if you want to refresh your memory on what's coming up the following week, simply go to the KINS website. It will be posted there. And very briefly, I want to uh, share my screen with you just to show you what is coming up. I already mentioned Rabbi Fetter. And we are honored to have on January 5th, Rabbi Sholem Fishbein, who is the Kashrus coordinator for the Chicago Rabbinical Council. And he is going to speak on the Kashrus considerations for food manufacturer. Uh, there will be some other presentations in January. We're still firming up the schedule and we will keep you apprised of what's coming up. Thank you all very, very much for attending. Hopefully we'll see you next week, same time. Have a Thank good you.